Yeah, hello to everyone. Uh, I think Leonard has left, which is a shame. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I'm talking not about System D and Arthur's loss uh, uh, and Vision, well, a little bit. Uh, my main focus is log method processing, uh, formatting, and normalizing with Arthur's log uh, and the standards involved with that. Uh, what's in my talk? Uh, I cover some logging basics that we need to follow what I'm trying to say. Uh, I have a practical usage scenario that's driven by actual customer demand. I've taken that out and trimmed it to a very small uh, uh, environment, but hopefully suitable to see some of the new features that we have in version 7. Uh, I will hopefully be able to talk a little bit about uh, logging APIs and if then still time is left, uh, I have some background information on log processing. Uh, and I will most probably, well, not finish in time, but that's a little bit by intention. I thought rather than uh, shrinking the presentation, uh, I have some stuff at the end that is bonus. So if you have questions, feel free to ask in between. That would be great. Uh, why logging? That's important to set the stage for what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the individual desktop. Uh, I'm talking about uh, enterprise environments uh, with lots and lots of systems, and most importantly, uh, with a very heterogeneous environment. There are very different systems exist, and very different systems uh, tend to log. And what we use logging in this case is obviously troubleshooting. That's no problem. Uh, then, very important is security alerting, uh, and security alerting uh, in regard to closed source software like Serium. Uh, we don't we always see a lot of Serium systems uh, uh, included in the system. Uh, then we have legal requirements, for example, in the financial industry. Very, very tough legal requirements regarding auditing and logging. Uh, data to be used as evidence in court. Uh, we have special requirements regarding signatures, etc., for uh, this. Uh, and a very interesting use case, uh, that's billing from the telecom industry. Uh, we have a lot of customers who uh, bill your phone bill uh, by sending syslog messages. So they have some interest in uh, retaining their data and they have some interest in that it's not untakeable. Uh, but they also have interest that their system continues to run even if there's some problem within the logging subsystem. So you don't want to have totally lossless logging under all constraints. Uh, what peop many people tell me if we start to discuss casually uh, that is logging is, is simple. It's just generate a log record when something interesting happens. That's right. So basically it's very simple. But what is interesting? Which event do I really need to log? Not to log too much, not to log too less. Uh, what is interesting? Uh, what is required to describe the event? For example, if I create a file, uh, which metadata uh, do I need when I log it? Uh, how do I need to log user ID, textual name, some ideas? Uh, how do we know what the actual data item means? Different developers uh, tend to follow different well, disciplines uh, when logging. Uh, and it's often very hard to guess what the data item actually means. Uh, and finally, what does the log record itself look like? They are very different looking log record. And I'm totally with Leonard uh, that the traditional text-based log uh, is actually a mess. So we need some structure. And my talk is also about this. So in general, making sense out of log uh, is actually a tough business, a much tougher business than it uh, initially looks. So that leads to something that I call the logging dilemma. Uh, they're actual, and I'm in the logging field for almost, well, 18 or 19 years now. Uh, there's no universally accepted format. There is a myriad of formats, but none of them is universally accepted. Uh, logs looking very much the same, look like they describe the exactly same thing, but from different vendors or different projects, uh, they often describe different events. It's not the same. And in my opinion, even worse, uh, the, the same event 
can be described in very, very different ways. It means the same thing, but if, if you look at it, you don't notice it. Uh, often these pseudo C form text is used, uh, and all of this makes it very, very hard for consumers to interpret blocks that are from a heterogeneous system. I'm not talking about just Linux over here. And it's a real world problem. I got an excerpt from a uh, mail that I got uh, six or seven weeks ago, just in time for the conference, I would say. Uh, and the important part is just that some actual real world customer complaining that they have a bunch of different devices, a bunch of vendors, uh, and they want to make sense out of these logs push it into their CM system, uh, and they seem to have multiple of them, what's not uncommon to what I hear, uh, but they can't get their SAM system to understand it because they would need to write parsers, 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 parsers for each, of each system, and that's code prohibitive. So this is what they actually have. They have on the top a number of uh, log sources, and that's just a, a small excerpt. We have Linux boxes, uh, we, we have uh, other Unix systems that log differently. Uh, we have typically a lot of applications like Apache, for example, that create logs. Uh, we have in an enterprise environment, we always have Windows. We, well, yeah, we always, I, I would say we always have some Windows systems uh, or even a large bunch of Windows systems that uh, log to the system. Uh, we have firewalls and Cisco routers and all that. So very diverse sources. Uh, and, and we have tools that should consume all this, uh, but each of these sources have very, very different uh, semantics, very, very different syntax. So it's very hard to consume that, and the question is how can I go from here down to over here? Let's try to classify the log sources a little bit. That helps. Uh, we have the traditional C form sources. Uh, foremost in the Linux environment, uh, the traditional syslog messages, which look like natural language, uh, but if you look closely enough, uh, which are not natural language. Uh, it's just that you have some strings, and in between these strings that look like natural language, you actually have fields. It's just hard to figure them out. But it's not as hard as natural language searches. By far not as hard. And we have application text log files, Apache being one prime example. Then we have structured formats. Foremost, very important, we have the Windows event log, uh, which has something well, very similar to the journal uh, for many years. And it has very well-defined structure. That's a good thing about it. It's very bloated. That's a bad thing about it. Uh, we have the Linux journal. Uh, which promises some structure and if used properly uh, in the long term can provide it, but currently mostly the thing for, well, the traditional syslog uh, text messages. So it's kind of a uh, transition phase, I would say. Then we have application text log files that are structured, quite a lot of them. Uh, some in XML, uh, a lot in CSV data, uh, uh, formats like Welch, well, uh, Apache CLF, ah, yeah, Apache uh, structured sample. Then we have SNMP chat, and we have new style syslog, uh, which also provides us some uh, structure. And, and that these are the prime things that we see as input to syslog teams. So <coughs> how can we solve that dilemma? The industry tried for many, many years uh, with very limited success, to phrase it politely. I was involved in a couple of these efforts, and I have to say that we failed in reaching real consensus. Uh, the last effort that's quite promising from the uh, goals uh, is something that's named common event expression. That's an effort led by U.S. Mitchell. Uh, it's a cross-vendor team, both from the open source environment uh, and from Merkin uh, players. Very large team which sets up some alert on <laughs> getting decisions, so it's very slow moving. Uh, and it's always threatened in being shut down and moving on, but it's moving, at least. And uh, finally, last year, we managed to get to some formal documentation that one can build on. So that's, that's important. And no matter what happens now, we have this spec and common understanding. 
Uh, and an important point it is, is it builds on existing infrastructure. Yeah, I can skip that. Uh, three core ideas are important. Uh, a core idea is to keep it very, very simple. The I've seen very good logging standards, uh, excellent logging standards that never made it into practice because it was so complex uh, that people simply didn't accept it. Developers didn't use it, end users didn't use it. So keeping it simple is a key thing in succeeding. Uh, CE doesn't intend to invent new technologies, but uh, support what's already out there and just tie a little bit different together. As far as the format is concerned, CEE uses name value pairs, very simple name value pairs, just like uh, the journal does. Uh, there's a strong discussion in the logging world for many years if you have a very deep structure uh, li like we have in ODMF and uh, these things, or if things should be flat, very flat. If we look at existing applications on the analysis, analysis part, uh, even closed source tools, they all expect a flat structure. They have a very hard time working on structures. Uh, and CE does a compromise. It's kept as flat as possible, but permits some structure if actually necessary. Yeah, and there are two points I intended to mention, but they are not, well, finalized as much as I would like them. Uh, if we have field names, it would be good to know except uh, totally what it means. Uh, so in CE, the uh, idea of a dictionary is there, can look up the field and know exactly what it means, host vendor thing. Uh, same for profiles. The profile specifies what exactly needs to be logged when a file is created, for example. And if you want to be compliant to CE, you need to log these in the uh, field. But the current spec is not very uh, good in this regard. Project Lumberjack builds on top of CE, and it was born uh, last year, right here in Bruno at the developer conference. Uh, it intends to build CE, uh, well, it intended to build CE, uh, and implement it, and we already did this. It, it builds on CE and drives the ideas further in an open source environment. Uh, we intended and we did build an open source reference implementation of it with all the bits that are needed uh, and to deliver something that's not perfect but that actually works. It's not perfect. Still a lot of room of improvement. And I think the most important thing is that uh, uh, a couple of logging professionals, both from Red Hat uh, and developer guys with Syslog NG and ourselves, uh, got together, uh, putting that into actual things that are used in, in, in large enterprises right now. So what we did we do? Uh, we agreed on the format, which was simple because it was simply CE. <coughs> uh, we made our syslog fully lumberjack aware so that the uh, lumberjack format can be used in our syslog. Well, I'm also, I have to admit, a Windows guy. At least my company is uh, also a Windows company. We create Windows uh, logging tools as well. And we took the liberty uh, to create a Lumberjack implementation on Windows so that we can integrate Windows into a Lumberjack system. That's the event log down there. Uh, Bellabit uh, did the same for Syslog NG. And as far as I know, uh, it fully implemented what's needed. Uh, and uh, Algonon from Bellabit uh, also created a new Syslog API, slight, new, very small uh, API uh, that's called libamberlog, uh, and that permits the traditional Syslog uh, with structured data. So let's get back to my inbox and back to my practical case. This customer, not surprisingly, uh, asked for the capability to convert these various formats uh, into a common format. I left the actual format out because it was not uh, Lumberjack, <laughs> but it could have been Lumberjack, and uh, I hope that in the future it will more often be. So what he actually wants is have this picture, uh, have the, the various sources going to the central R syslog daemon, and to be honest, it could also mention syslog ng over here. It's essentially the same thing. Uh, and convert it in a format that all of these can digest. 
Yeah. And what I'm trying now uh, is I've created a small sample that tries to convert three sources uh, to, to a common format. If you look closely, you'll notice that this sample is a joke. But I had only that much time. So in a larger environment, it's, it's not pretty much the same thing, but it allows me to showcase how it's done in Arsenal Select. And in order to do that, I need to tell you a little bit about two concepts, at least, uh, that Arsenal has, and that may be not that well known because they are recent additions. Uh, first and foremost, we have rule sets. We have them for quite some while. Uh, a rule set is, well, a set of rules. Uh, it's like a function in a programming language that, that you can uh, call, and it tells uh, via conditional statements and actions what to do with a method. Uh, and a rule set can be nested in that it can be called from another rule set, or it can be bound, for example, to a TCP listener, so that every message that comes in via that uh, uh, list port is automatically forwarded to that rule set and then processed by it. And we also have variables. That's no surprise. Uh, we have the traditional variables that stem back to the syslog uh, RFCs and to the syslog message content. Uh, that's dollar uh, $MFG, dollar $RAW MFG, dollar syslog priority, and so on. And th then we have a couple of system variables, very few, like dollar dollar now, which gives you a current time stamp. Uh, and we added tree-like structures. Uh, this is the lower part here, structured variables. Uh, and in Lumberjack, we agreed that we use the uh, bang sign as a path delimiter. Uh, so what that means is we have a variable uh, that's structured, user, and it has a branch USR, and under there are some variables. And we can use that. And I'll use that syntax later on. But you can structure it as is, and uh, remote systems can also provide this structure. That's important, for example, if, if you receive Windows uh, events, or if, if you receive uh, structured events from some application. So let's look at the practical, <coughs> very simple case. Uh, I wanted to have a log on, log off report. Uh, it's for processing by some backend tool, which I will not show, uh, some hypothetical. Uh, I've concentrated on just four fields. Uh, that's the host system, reception time, username, and the status, stat status if it is in log on or log off. Uh, as input, uh, I have actually three, even though it looks like two. Uh, I have Linux, uh, traditional log messages. It's I, I want to showcase three form text messages. Uh, and I have two Windows sources, uh, because Windows is a little bit challenging. And as I said, it's very often used, especially in this context that I'm working with uh, uh, in Arsenal Slot. And as output, we have Lumberjack and we have traditional CSV. Could be uh, whatever else. So we just need to make our syslog gather the data. We load our TCP input module. I assume everything go comes via TCP. Uh, even the Linux data, I say, I'm on a central host, so I expect it to come in via TCP. Uh, and I define three different <coughs> listeners to ease my rule set development. One, one for the Windows with the our syslog agent on, on that port, then one for Linux. Uh, and another one for the snare agent, which is, which is quite popular. Uh, so I intended uh, to show uh, it as well. So it's pretty simple. Well, let's look at the Linux uh, data sample. Uh, it's the three form format. We, I have, uh, what did I take? Uh, sudo uh, and SSHD uh, data. We see the fields, uh, uh, for example, we see if it's a lock on or lock off on this open and close. So we have fields even though it looks like it's uh, three form, three form set. The, the thing that we need to do is we need to extract uh, the usernames. We need to extract the uh, session open close information uh, to, to get uh, hold of the information that we want to have. And we traditionally do this with regular expressions but regular expressions are pretty slow. And uh, so what I use here is a module from our syslog that's called mm normalize. It's actually available since 
Yeah, it's quite a while, one and a half years to two years. Uh, it uses something that called a sample rule base, and I have a sample of a sample rule base uh, just on the next uh, slide. Uh, the core idea is that the sample contains facts for matching, uh, like fashion or uh, these things, uh, and it contains descriptions for the field. Uh, like this is an IP4 address, or this is a word which is something that's terminated by a state, or uh, what's this here, uh, character match, etc. cetera. Uh, if it matches this sample, and it's called sample because the, the core idea was a user takes that from a log file and uses it as a, as a sample to fit in the uh, field description. Uh, if the sample matches the fields I expected, then and only then. Uh, there's a special parser for IP tables because that's pretty easy to pass uh, as it's already in some structured format. It's implemented as an action inside our syslog workflow. Uh, the key point is it has a very, very, very fast algorithm behind it. Much, much faster than regular expressions so that you can use it in real time uh, or even may maybe for very large sets for close to near real time. Uh, it's essentially very close to O1. Uh, it's not O1, uh, depending on the rule base. In worst case, it can be great, but it's in, in practice, it's very close to constant science. Uh, the rule module is based on lib-log norm, uh, which does all that what's on the slide. Uh, and that's a library that you can include in your applications as well. And for example, a tool like uh, Kagan <coughs> does this for high performance uh, data extraction. So let's look at the rule base. Uh, this is uh, not at the rule base, out at the, ah, <laughs> got myself, yeah. Uh, initially it was named the sample base and now it's the rule base. Uh, what I say is I have a prefix uh, defined for every uh, message and this prefix has a date in IFC 3164 format and we want to save that in a field that's named receive data. Uh, and then comes the space and we have a uh, receive from field, that's a word, that's actually the host name, just named it receive from in that sample. And then we have the rules for the messages, just taking one and uh, explain it a little more. Inside a rule, we have fixed text, like FSHD, then the brace, and then the percent signs indicate a field start. So we have a number field here, it must be numerical, an integer. And these dash means we are not interested in the actual value. So it must be an integer in order to be a proper match, uh, to be sure we detect the correct thing, uh, but we don't need it. We can throw it away as soon as it's uh, matched. Then again, we have other constant text. And uh, of course, here's information that is interesting, but not for my sample. So I just left it in as constant text. And down here, we have something that I'm interested in. Uh, it's a word and a string delimited by white space, uh, and that's stored in a property named type, and so on. Uh, what's important is, uh, here's the last field that I actually used. In order to make sure that the see from text matches correctly, and it's not a false positive, I need to specify the rest of the message. Uh, and so I also need to uh, have a field, a number field, uh, right at the bottom, just to make sure that's properly detected and there's no false positive. So whenever we, what happens if the matching engine runs is only if the whole thing has a perfect match, then it's detected. And if you look at actual data and larger rule sets and larger rule bases, you'll notice that that is very, very important because otherwise you get a lot of uh, false positive. Back to something that looks, uh, at least in my point of view, a bit nicer. Uh, what we do in that rule set that first has the Linux logs is we call this MM normalize and we give it this rule base that I showed on the last slide. Uh, and when it returns, it has a property that's named path success. And if that's okay, uh, then it means we had a match. It was okay. Uh, and ah, that's a leftover from, uh, from some broader example. And if, if, we, have, if we, we had path success and there's a user, then we go into our uh, uh, normalizing engine with 
actually is something that a user can script things up. Uh, and we set variables. For example, we set our own type, which we don't want to have opened and closed, but log on and log off, because we wanted to have a single uh, name for all log sources. This is, by the way, something that's under consideration and uh, the versions of our syslog that are upcoming will probably have a lookup uh, table support to, to just create uh, this without the if statement. So and finally what we do is uh, I create this USR tree and I shuffle over some of the uh, data that I extracted over to the USR tree. Uh, the whole reason for doing that is that I call another rule set down here that's called outrider and this output rider is called by all other normalization uh, paths, uh, and it expects things to be in that user tree, because that's the normalized stuff. Well, <laughs> Windows horrors. Uh, that's a snare Windows message. Uh, being after being received by our syslog, snare transmits uh, uh, tab characters, which are non-printable and thus in a little bit violation of the RFCs. The RFCs work escapes this. Uh, and so we, we have the tabs as being these uh, hash 011 uh, representations. Nevertheless, uh, that whole thing is kept delimited. So we have fields. We know exactly which field has at what, what which position. Uh, and we can digest it, <coughs> digest it by this position. So what we do in the snare path is we take the raw message and we have something in our syslog that's called, that's a function field. And we can ask our syslog to extract the sixth field, for example, uh, based on this string. And what happens here is uh, I, I simply go through the uh, event and take out everything uh, based on field. Know how to handle that. And here we see this user type the sixth field is defined to be the Windows event ID. And an event of uh, 4634 means that's a log off. And an event of 4634 means that's a log on. And so we set the uh, corresponding property. Well, still Windows horrors. Uh, that's with the R-Syslog agent. Uh, R-Syslog agent uses native lumberjack format. Uh, it's still a mess, but it's a structured mess. Uh, <laughs> And I have to say, this is cut off. Uh, if it would fit on the slide, I think this, uh, I would end down here <laughs> somewhere. So that's a single event. Uh, but the structured mess provides us with field names and values. Uh, so we have a target username, for example, and we have the value for the target username. And what, what the Arthur's log agent does, it takes the native Windows field names uh, and populate the lumberjack event with this native Windows field name. And then we can digest that on the Linux side. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me go back to that later. We can digest that on the Windows side uh, via a module named <coughs> mmjson task, which actually is the lumberjack parser. It can not only digest Windows logs, it can digest Linux logs if they are in lumberjack format. It can digest them if they come from Cisco and are in lumberjack format. Uh, and <coughs> this mmjson pass, uh, again, checks if it is lumberjack. And if it's a lumberjack, then it populates the uh, property. And here you see the native Windows property name. And again, we shuffle that over to our output uh, string. Uh, yeah. So now we need to write out the normalized data. And that's pretty simple. Uh, we just have this output writer rule set, and it creates two files, uh, one in CSV format and one in CE format. And the whole work is actually done in templating. In our syslog, we have a templating engine. And that templating engine, uh, we have a template for CSV. And here we take property for property and tell it that the output from it should be CSV. Uh, and in the case of uh, Lumberjack CE, it's even simpler. We have a other type of template where we just say, this at CE column is the indicator that, that it is Lumberjack. And then we just take the JSON tree uh, in USR 
uh, formats and it populates all that automatically. And finally, it looks like that. Uh, we have that over here is the Linux event. And this is from Snare, I think. Yeah, that is, is from Snare. And this is, uh, these are events from uh, the R syslog agent from Windows. So it looks the same, and now the tool can digest it. And the same in tier three. So in essence, we, we normalize that. Yeah. Uh, as I said, that's a small sample. Uh, the and the normalized part is very important nowadays if we want to normalize things that come from Cisco firewalls, for example, or from, from other network devices because we still have this deform text format and we need to convert it and we need to convert it fast into something that we can use. Uh, output is highly flexible, of course. Uh, and what I totally skipped is that, uh, of course, we have outputs like MongoDB and Elasticsearch, which uh, natively support the structured data uh, and can be used to build uh, high performance applications. Yeah. Um, bottom line is what many customers use our syslog for is like a universal translator. Uh, we have various sources of logs uh, and be able to get them into a single single in memory representation, a single object format uh, that our syslog understands. And out of this object format, we can create whatever the uh, end user actually needs. We will do this with uh, Lumberjack, uh, but to be honest, not many tools currently understand Lumberjack, so uh, we also be able to write any other formats that it's needed. And, and adding a new format to our syslog is very, very, very easy, very, very quickly done. Yeah, I think I can skip that. Yeah, long-term vision. Uh, the, the most important thing on this slide is that there never will be a single format. I hoped for that for many years, but I'm totally convinced now that we will continue to have various different formats. Even though I hope that uh, Lumberjack will be one of the dominating formats, uh, simply because we have an open source implementation, we, we, we uh, in the position, if, if we get good tools to work with it and if people catch up on it, we are in a position to force the closed source guys to support it. That means the open source guys have, have less, wor less work to do than the closed source guys. Uh, <coughs> But we'll see. Uh, a good thing is to use as few formats as possible. That's for sure. But if I look at real world deployments, a uh, customer has this and that uh, appliance, this and that uh, router, this and that device. And well, it, it is like it is. And we need to live with this mess. And that's a lot of what our syslog is about, uh, handling the mess and getting something useful out of it. Yeah, I have a couple of announcements to uh, make. Uh, we just wrote a front end or enhanced the front end, a graphical front end web application uh, for uh, uh, Lumberjack format. So we finally have some app that's able to uh, display at least Lumberjack in a nice way. Though I have to admit, uh, our log analyzer is nothing for the high end, it's for the low to medium end. It doesn't scale to the high end. Uh, I think an even more interesting announcement is that uh, our lib logging uh, that provided some logging services uh, <coughs> has been enhanced to support the journal API and to act as a replacement library for what the journal API does. Uh, and it, it will only support the log creation subset of that API. There's no point in mimicking, mimicking the database access. That's perfectly done by the journal. And there's really no point in doing that. We don't intend to use that. Uh, but a, a core idea behind this uh, is we want to permit the use of the journal API on platforms that don't have a journal. And why do we want to do this? Because we think uh, the journal API is actually a good API. And even though I'm not the biggest fan of the journal, uh, I would definitely like to see people adapt a structured logging API 
because that makes my life easy. And if that structured logging API is a journal API, that's fine. And so we actually have some interest uh, in people picking it up and a, a showstopper today is uh, that they are bound to the journal. And with that library, which I have shamelessly taken out of Leonard's source tree and modified a little bit and all that, uh, we, <coughs> we have the ability to run the journal API, the log creation part, everywhere we want. And I also talked to some enterprise customers and they injected an idea of being able to preload that library and redirect the journal API directly to Syslog. Not sure if that's something that actually will happen, uh, but the idea behind that uh, was, and I probably need to talk to Leonard if there are other ways to do it. Don't like preloading, it's a bit of hackish. Uh, the core idea behind this was, uh, we have very, very high-end customers sending several 10,000 to 100,000 messages to the Syslog API. And they say, if we'll end up in two years from now uh, sending them to the journal and having it written something and then being re-injected to a system, th that's too slow. We, we don't get the performance we need out there. Uh, so isn't there a way that we can uh, use the, the API or have applications that use it and push them directly to the syslog daemon? Because all we want to do is ship this off the machine as soon as possible. We don't want to have it uh, locally there, except if we have a buffering case, which are syslog off, syslog and dhandle. So this is something that may or may not happen. Keen in writing that. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in creating that. And that is actually something that's in my source tree and I'll publish it most probably tomorrow. But it's, it's pretty, it's running code. Uh, there will also be a new plugin, plugin available to read the journal data and to read the uh, uh, structured uh, part of the journal data uh, so that we can get the full benefit of what's stored <coughs> inside it without this library. So I, I don't need to do some preload magic to obtain uh, what's there. If, if someone on a journal-enabled system uses the journal API to lock uh, uh, structured data, this plugin will be able to pick it up directly. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that this is a contribution from uh, Red Hat, so I didn't need to dig too deeply into that. <laughs> uh, Another thing that I'm actively working on, and we'll see the first implementation by end of last month, this month, last? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> next month, end of March, uh, is we will get some very strong log signature system. Uh, and it will be based on uh, the open CSI uh, structure, uh, keyless signature initiative. Uh, and the initial, as this is not finished, the initial version will be uh, based on RFC 3161, which is an industry standard for uh, doing log signing. And that's half finished already. API, yeah. Uh, glad I have time for that. Uh, we have API syslog traditional, of course. Uh, we have libumberlog, which uh, was the library written natively for uh, the Lumberjack uh, project. Uh, it, it's relatively slim layer above the uh, syslog API. In essence, it provides the ability to log structured data plus the ability to add some of the metadata that the journal adds, more or less the same. Uh, it can be preloaded to enhance old style uh, interface. It was written by a Bellabit guy, Algernon. It's a very good library uh, uh, and we hope it gets uh, used. Uh, but we also have the system D journal, as I said, it's, it's a nice API and if people use it, I really, uh, I'm really happy. Uh, it's very similar, I think I have, yeah, I have a sample that's better uh, to show the actual code sample than to uh, talk about it. This is the Umberlog, uh, sys Syslog API, and this is the journal API, the native journal API. Uh, Different is it's syslogish, so we have the syslog priority as we have it in uh, syslog. In journal, it's a bit uh, well uh, hidden <laughs> down here. Uh, then we have the locked in, uh, the traditional syslog part uh, in essence, uh, plain text with some variables. Same over here. Uh, and then we have structured elements. 
name and values, same over here. Key difference, they, they involved more or less at the same time, uh, but this wasn't, uh, well, stable at the time we intended to do that. So in, in uh, journal, you have uh, name plus type in one parameter, and in Umberlock, you have the name and you have the type in another parameter. But other than that, it's essentially the same. Uh, in lib logging, yeah, just let me focus on the lower part. Uh, we also plan to do an abstraction layer. The core idea, uh, taking the log, the journal replacement library a step further, the core idea is the developer doesn't need to care about the logging system. Actually, that's the last thing that a typical de developer wants to care about. Uh, so I intend to write, and intend, no code written yet, uh, intend to write a simple new structured API, very, 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 very slim layer. Uh, the target is less than 1,500 lines of code. Uh, and it, the key feature is that it permits to select the actual log provider, be it journal, be it syslog, be it whatever, uh, at runtime, for example, via an environment variable or via some configuration file, so that you actually compile your application to that library and then the user decides uh, which logging system he wants to use. It's a bit inspired by Log4j, but much slimmer. Very easy to use. Easy to use, it's very important <laughs> for log, <laughs> for getting things logging. And it would probably look like this over here. So it's in essence uh, modeled a bit like the uh, Umberlock, uh, Umberlock, except that we have something that's called a channel which permits to write to different logging systems at the same time, if that's required. Uh, and I will probably uh, use these uh, separate data types because it improves the speed of the application. And our syslog is a lot about uh, speed. We have to write very, very high data rates. Uh, so I it's more convenient and much faster if I have the type in a separate argument than if I need to parse it up. Yeah, I think that's a good slide to conclude uh, the talk. Uh, yeah. So if you have a question and if you have uh, time left, then I can, yeah, if there are questions, I'm glad to take. Yeah, very good question. Uh, and actually one I've been asked quite often. Uh, I, I can give you an URL to my blog post which has this full story, uh, but the short story is uh, our syslog is uh, optimized for speed. And it's in, in some non-obvious ways. It, it's highly, highly multi-threaded. Uh, and we, we try to integrate this with Lua and it, it doesn't work. We, we, we don't get the, the speed benefit out of it. As I said, I have an in-depth analysis on my, uh, on my blog. Uh, one example, uh, if, if, if we process mes messages, we process them in batches of mes messages, depending on how much is there. And the, the whole script engine uh, works like a single instruction multiple data computer. So uh, if, if we call an action, we actually do not call it with one uh, message, but we, we have maybe a thousand of them that are processed somewhat in parallel. And this is something that Lua doesn't give us. So we would totally need to rewrite that. So that's, otherwise it's very, very tempting. And it looks like a complete language, but conditionals and calls are the only things that I intend to support. Uh, there were some people asking about loops, uh, but I don't think it fits in there. Yeah. I think I cut you off here because I'm running finally out of time. Uh, but if you have a minute, we can uh, talk about this. So sorry for no more questions, but I'm out there. <laughs> Thank you.